This week on Hermitcraft. You might have to go yeah. over to the permit office and clear that. <laughs> oh, I, I've really been trying to avoid going to the permit office. It does Me not too, look man. fun. Welcome to the Hermitcraft Recap. My name is Pixorifs, our writer is Loy XP. Captions on this video were provided by Liara. And that's not actually the recap theme you're hearing, that's the hold music as we try to file our permit for reporting all the latest from the Hermitcraft server. Apparently we're next in the queue and our call is very important to them. This week the economy continues to build as the Hermits firm up shop plans and payment systems, the neighbourhood downsizes in a Matt Damon sort of way, and the mail system reaches the sophistication of AOL from 1998. So let's dial up our 56k modems and take a look at all the events and mishaps that occurred on the Hermitcraft server this week. Starting with good times with Scar, who has a serious prankstropod infestation. Ah, those pesky, pesky little snails here. Look at them. Is they're so adorable and cute, it's hard to be really mad at them. <laughs> After jailing the giant snail, as well as Jem and Grian's personal ones, he finds an army of regular-sized brown snails have replaced the big one. Ever the polite host, Scar arranges the visitors a homey meal of escargot, and also arranges the visitors into the homey meal of escargot. It's really messed up that way. Though Jem's snail is canonically from space, so it's not cannibalism, they're clearly just invasive species. Which, we could have told you. This wasn't my idea in the slightest. It was the pink snail and the turquoise snail. This was their idea. Where the train car with the snail once has been, Scar builds a new wagon housing a greenhouse and a decorative open air bee nest on a moving train. And I cannot begin to describe to you all the reasons why this wouldn't work unless those bees are super buff. Buff bees. And one of my favorite things about the honey hive here is the mo- Ooh, hello there. <laughs> Scar better become real tanky himself since his special order of explosive fireworks came in. Cubfan135 heard him loud and clear when Scar ordered hot guy themed explosive fireworks, but not as loud as the colored stars of his rockets blow when launched from a multi shot crossbow. Not at me, oh, not at the ground! <laughs> Somehow I survived! Cub even rigs the final recipe to mass produce, so in theory he could deliver a new batch any time. Though there are diamonds in the star formula, so yeah, it costs $400,000 to fire this weapon for 12 seconds. Except, uh, since we've been crafting up so many fireworks, we might have had a little incident with our lab coat, so... yeah. Hypnotized is not sparing any resources when it comes to annoying Wells Knight. But I definitely just heard fireworks go off. Oh! They're literally coming from Hypno's house. Hi, Wells. How's it going? What? I can't hear you. I'm deafened over the infernal racket that you're creating. As soon as Wells has discovered and discussed the situation with the sky above his house exploding occasionally, Hypno is already digging an extra detection system under his home to go off, even when Hypno is offline and occasionally trigger the firework cannon. The Skulk Sensor experiments even inspire him to install a home security system that informs him whenever his front door is closed and opened. Almost as if there's now someone who would like to throw a brick through his window who also has a brick permit. We'll, we'll go with that. Gives us our bricks and our nether bricks, and we'll make a proper, more involved shop down the road. As for Hypno's allies, Rendog and him have successfully roped false symmetry into their Roof of the Nether Gold Farm Piglin Barter setup collab, and as the holder of the concrete permit, she is of course very interested in a farm that produces infinite gravel. For your concrete shop, we can provide the resources for half of the concrete shop. If that would be amazing. You come and help us make the place look better, shall we? Their empire only takes a small hit when Keralis jokingly walks out of Ren's shop without paying, meaning that for once, this is actually a robbery. Go away, I need to record now. Hey everybody, uh, welcome <laughs> back to the beacon shop. It's time to check on the profits. It looks like on this side there's been, there's been, wait, there's been a thievery. There's been a thievery, Keralis! Stop! You violated the law. To better escape his crimes in the future, Corrales channels the gunpowder from his underground creeper farm into an autocrafter merged with a sugarcane one. The resulting firework rockets travel all the way to his bedroom, where he can grab a stack first thing in the morning. But now we can just sit here and just watch our rockets coming in. Very, very, very slowly, I guess. Back after a medical emergency, I, Jevin, is eager to hang out with his friends, and luckily the stream day is just the time for that. Armor if you could die to an armor stand, I would totally give you a book for that. Ha 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 ha!
After selling Joe Hill's Elytra for his head, he finally starts his permitted wings business, selling them out of a miniature end ship in a miniature end lake at the shopping district. It's fog effect all the way down, and very reminiscent of his own Season 9 Shulker Farm Island biome. You know, it really bugs me, by the way, that we don't have endstone bricks and the endstone to make a border. Having found herself surrounded with the river she built last week, False Symmetry throws a bridge over it and does in fact cross it when she gets there. The publicity body of water does its job well though. After taking a trip down the fun tunnel, Rendog decides to purchase a river himself. But with Ren's law being what it is, it just had to be the planet-appropriate sulfur river to flow through his backyard, so it's a custom terraforming project somewhere in the future. It's quite slow. I'm not sure people will be vibing with that one. <laughs> the neighbourhood does undertake an terraforming project of sorts, and it sure does take it under when Rendog decides to finally move the ministry meetup spot to a nicer place. Their new hole in the ground wins out on square footage alone, but it helps that the cave for their secret society is also a miniature replica of the neighborhood skyline, a kind of mini golf version of the actual thing. <laughs> it's, uh, hey! Oh, hey, hey calm your laughing. It's a little bit on the teddy bear side. Because we ran out of time on stream, okay? We had a two hour window to do the whole thing. Perhaps appropriate then that Rendog has been windmilling a little as he tries to find something to do as the Minister of Ministries. All his other ventures are a success. The Beacon Shop has now raised enough diamonds to fund a shopping spree for his upcoming projects, but he desperately wants to drop his governmental roll off on someone else. And then I decided that I just didn't want to do your job because that's what would happen if I said anything. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, nobody else wants it, but that just means collectively they decide the job should not exist. The others help Ren transition to the position of Minister of Mail by mailing him to the afterlife. We wish him all the best in his post-mortem job. Oh, there we go, false. Oh, hey. <laughs> but while Ren's power as a minister is waning, his logging power is only growing thanks to Azumavoid, who has now built them a headquarters in the shape of a giant tree stump. It sure conveys that they mean business, but won't be starting one because they have no permit. Smallish Beans actually creaks the door open on potentially getting duplicate permits, though his permit copies are not actually functional and neither are they existent, because Grian has had him on various levels of hold for the past week. Put you on hold. Come okay, on. okay, give me the disc, give me the disc. I'm fine, I'll open up, I'll open up, I'll open up. He plays this character a little too well. It's almost like he's enjoying it. The whole thing starts with Joel wanting to display his glowing permit both at his wonderfully decorated shop and back home. And that armor stand statue of a glow squid is certainly the most creative thing anyone's done with Corallus's candles so far. That's what? your candles. What? <laughs> that is so neat. But the permit duping form asks for some shenanigans to be performed, and that's why Joel puts googly eyes into Gemini Tay's cliff skull. Let's ruin it. I just want to say sorry, Gem, off the start. She might not be watching this. Ooh, I rolled my skull. Come on. <laughs> At the time I'm recording this, my video completing the skull has not even been posted for 24 hours yet. Jem pays it forward and graffitis the word slay and the better half of an Among Us spaceman on Impulse SV's big wall. Despite knowing full well who orchestrated the googling, Jem still goes end raiding with Grian, eager to go into the shulker box monster phase of the game. And a more powerful item transportation will be really handy now that she's opened up her permit based shops at the B00 street in the market, selling Gemini moss and Gemini clay. That was a long day of working in the shopping district. Grian is not far behind, toiling away at his mushroom blocks and stem farm, even if producing them en masse turned out to be a tad more difficult than one would expect especially if you decide to auto-farm bone meal to auto-feed them too. Design from Jurassics. This is a design by They6. I am a titan of industry. Check this out. I have copied a tutorial. But it works more reliably than the horse stable he makes somehow, so that's a potato out of Sahara Redstone rating if ever we saw one. Speaking of which, Perlescent Moon and her team of postmasters have been expanding the mail system to anyone eligible. After testing the latest four additions to the service, Pearl sets about expanding her base and setting up the solar punk theme she has planned for the season. Part of this expansion includes a mailbox of her own, which Grian immediately rebrands with the traditional UK pillar box, then promptly breaks the whole mail system by sending a potato to Mumbo, who doesn't have a mechanism to receive anything yet. It's gonna go into the lost mail. There it goes. All right. 
It worked this time. I don't think Green used the shulker box. Right, so you got the egg, but not the potato. No. Theoretically, the system works as intended because Green's hopper minecart ends up in the lost packages area in the nether, but the alleged vegetable contents have mysteriously vanished. In the meantime, Pearl works on a lost and found service at the post office where any missing packages can be relocated and investigated, then parks a brand new bone vending vehicle outside of B00's bamboo alley. Bone truck is ready! It may not be a Corrales level truck, but it's pretty good for a little starter shop. Now that there's a tangible shopping district, there's an opportunity for certain hermits to indulge their shopping habits, which Etho promises aren't an addiction right before he spends all his diamonds on a lifetime supply of shulkers. 400 diamonds, lifetime supply, but you can never deplete my resources. Yes. In his defense, he wants to spend most of the season on a big project, so he's been doing a lot of resource gathering, has auto-crafting rocket farms hooked up to dispensers, and is convinced to expand that into scaffolding by B-Dubs' demonstration wall. Somebody told me a way to do it. Wait, how close am I? Oh, I went way too high. Uh-oh. I broke the bell. <laughs> Okay, I'm not quite sold on okay. the scaffolding just yet, Beatles. Let's try one no. more time, I think. And Impulse makes a similar trade for lifetime access to the Froglight farm, but he might still want to visit the Froglight shop for entertainment purposes. Inspired by B Dubs' scaffolding challenge and ZF's dripstone dodging minigame, Etho chooses to gamify Froglight purchases by building a Frogger course inside the shop. His glass shop is less challenging physically, but more challenging artistically. Uh, honestly, I was hoping it'd look a little cooler than it does, uh, but it's fine, right? It's Especially for Joe Hills and Good Times with Scar, who still own their separate glass permits, but have noticed the other collective goods licensees coming together to build group premises. Joe is determined to set his glass apart, so much so that he renames it, which is great for price communication, but is going to play havoc with the customer's inventory management. You can fit so many stacks of glass in this bad boy. Unorthodox trades are very much Joe's M.O. though, as he exchanges a bunch of coal and his own head to Ijevin for a set of elytra, barters several shulkers of grass blocks to Impulse SV in exchange for netherite upgrade templates, and swaps the names of a cat and a hot beverage to see if Zombie Cleo will notice. I've been having a lot of fun watching Cleo's episodes. I think she's a little bit suspicious of me though. She seems to think that those renamed diamonds I made might be fake. If cold beverages are more your speed, XB Crafted now has a blast chiller to keep them extra frosty. You can tell it's a blast chiller because Corrales suggests putting a blast furnace in it, which should work great unless you turn it on. The top is amazing, of course, yeah. Right. It well, the, the front's pretty cool, too. Corrales was really there to sell XB honey bottles, since they count as a food that could be stocked at half foods, but somewhere along the line, his horse gets stuck in the fridge along with Smallish Beans' head. <laughs> Brain works. I'm telling you that works. Let him just be there. XB eventually realizes the grocery store now has a better storage room than his house and decides to do something about that, complete with a floor of woven bones for the perfect blend of cozy and macabre. You could say the same about Joel's base, and B-Dubs does when he stops by to take a look around. It is really funny to see the horse whisperer getting a tour from the horse murderer. Yo! <laughs> Unbelievable. This whole place is just a cover. It's like, um, what, what do they call those places? Uh, laundering money? You're laundering horse heads. Business has been booming at B-Dubs' Bamboo Boutique, although it's mostly the full blocks and scaffolds that have been selling rather than everything in between. Still, when he decides to build a bamboo silo and fill it with an auto-crafting system for bamboo components, he still aims to make it capable of crafting most things, which it does, with no flaws whatsoever. I can't believe my greatness. Did I mention it's pretty much clog-proof, too? I lied. It clogged. It, it's not clog-proof. Vintage Beef, in the meantime, has a bamboo room that grows counterfeit bamboo. Sugarcane. It grows sugarcane. Mostly for books and quills. Still, we wanted it to sound like another Mafia operation purely so we could call him a bamboo-legger. What is going on on the server? Illegal stuff is what's going on. Illegal stuff. But Beef takes issue with the way some of these folks are doing business, whether it's Iskal buying shulker boxes in subtle ways from Doc M, or Rendog requiring patrons of the beacon shop to end a pearl or fly their way up to the sales floor. He's a lot happier getting a hot chocolate with his free mending book though, and he makes a start on one of his own stores, a basalt shop that will feature a crane supposedly hauling basalt from somewhere beneath the Earth's crust. Next time Beef looks up, he'll find a familiar platypus perched on top of his farmhouse. Stress Monster moves Perry away from Rendog's place, mostly to get away from the alarm system. 
Yeah. It's gone, I guess. Uh, he seems to he seems to move on a Friday, you know? It's like, uh, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know what you're talking about, though, Ren. He's his own person, I don't either. you know? Platypus wrangling aside, Stress's main focus for the week is establishing the Endrod store, in the hopes of satisfying all the cyberpunk builders this season has produced. After trying an automated approach to Chorus Flowers, but finding it too slow, she dips into the End Islands and hacks down whatever she can reach, then returns to the Overworlds to convince Iskel to help with a blaze farm. Fortunately, her mud shop has turned a profit, so she's able to invest those diamonds back into concrete and builds an eclectic, cartoon modern facade with a neon sign adorning the side. And if you're wondering what's going through her head, just ask Minnie Susan. What has he done to Susan? <laughs> So oh ugly. my I love god! It. Impulse is going to need some lighting variety once he gets sick of frog lights, which might happen now he's also using them to grid light the cyberpunk city plots. His latest addition to the city block is a record store which features organically farmed records, but the perimeter wall around the area now has its first mural splattered across one segment, so all things considered, the area is feeling a lot more artistic. You're gonna have to grow up, you're gonna have to be a little bit older before you can officially work here at the record shop. Impulse also sets up a quartz stall in the shopping district, now his bartering farm is churning out the crystals, and fits an XP ATM into his final hole in the wall. And we were bopping. I, I, I like I like to uh, say bop when I place blocks, if you haven't noticed. Doc M77 has finally disturbed the sound of silence, and darkness definitely is his old friend when he has a million wardens elsewhere, blocking new ones from spawning here and now. With all the armor templates in his possession and awaiting a shop to sell them, he returns his attention to big wood production and time lapses a tree farm designed by Lintex. Configurable for five different tree types, it produces a predictably large amount of wood, so much that he and Joe Hills need donkeys to help haul the shulker boxes of stock over to the wood store to be put on sale. Say, uh, I mean, the question is only do we do? F we want to be cheaper in bulk, right? It's a little bit of a discount versus three shulker boxes. Yeah, but the thing is, we don't want to make him count. While there, he discovers Cleo has come clean and shared the profits of book sales from Doc's starter villages, but absolving them of the need to pay him off in future because the new villages are now in place. And finally, there's Iskel, who's getting very rich on the back of his firework rocket license, but has decided to keep all his profits separate from his wallet just to track how much he earns over the duration of the season. By the looks of things, he's going to need a bigger box. But after Ren abdicates his duties as Minister Minister, Iskel sets up a system inspired by Hermit Challenges, which he can't remember super well, but knows it was funny. Effectively a dispenser surrounded by special effects, ringing the bell at this well of ideas will task someone with a mission, which currently ranges from buying out all the stock at someone else's shopping district store to building a house on top of someone else's base, which Iskel demonstrates on an unsuspecting Rendog. It remains to be seen whether Iskel is the chosen one who will restore balance to the neighborhood, or if this is just an extension of his duties as the Minister of Hell. And that's about it for this week's recap. Our writer is Loy XP, and my name is Pixel Riffs. Captions on this video were provided by Liara. Don't forget to leave a like while you're still here and subscribe so you won't miss future recaps. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next week. <laughs>